Yeah, back like boomerangs and spinal cords. It is the Sixers Talk podcast brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilm U works. That open always gets me going, man. Um, just missing the zoo a little part of it that we used to have. But uh, Noah Levick, Danny Pommel is here to bring you all the Sixers goings on as they have happened. Uh, our producer, Ben Barry, in the cut, making things happen as always. Enjoy it. We're coming to you live here from Rivers Casino. We are in the thick of March Madness and a lot of frivolity here on uh, Delaware Avenue. Um, the Sixers uh, snapped their eight-game winning streak to a team they shouldn't have lost to, but redemption comes swiftly with 11 games to go on the schedule as they battle the Chicago Bulls on Wednesday. They're a half game back in the standings of the Boston Celtics sitting in third place. Uh, 11 games to go. Noah, what's, what's the tenor of this, of the moment right now? What, what are you feeling? Loss last night was definitely a bummer, but I think none of us expected this to be like the end of 2017, 18. Well, when they, they won out. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, just the difficulty, the schedule, but as you said, I think most would have predicted the eventual loss would have been to a better team than the Bulls. Just, uh, very disappointing. And, Somewhat concerning night for James Harden uh, goes two for 14 from the floor. And to me, that did accurately reflect how poorly he played. Uh, just really tentative and shaky in key moments. And then we hear from Doc Rivers after the game oh, get right into it. No, that he was hurting a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and we know he missed more a month or more with that tendon issue in his foot. You would assume that that's what he's alluding to, unless it's a new foot injury that uh, he's not divulging. But he plays 46 minutes and in, they, they, what, what, make, help me make sense of the fact that he's on the floor for so long in the two OT game. I do want to tease and let people know that we'll get to heap some praise on Joel Embiid as well as George Carl's comments about Joel. Should we care? Should we not? But let's stick here with the Harden situation. Uh, we see him play 46 minutes, 0 for 6 from 3, 2 for 14 from the floor, 5 turnovers, although 12 assists as well. But then Doc Rivers, we thought it might have just been like one of those off games. But Doc Rivers says there might have been an injury related to that. Was that a surprise to you to hear Doc go that route? Or do you feel like, oh, yeah, well, maybe that was the old issue flaring up a bit? I, I think we're going to learn more in the coming hours and days. But to me, it was definitely noticeable when he went down on a play late in the second quarter, thought he should have gotten a foul call and. I think whenever Harden's down for an extended time, that is a little in the back of your mind of maybe a factor is frustration about the lack of a call, but he wasn't moving great once he uh, rose to his feet. And obviously his play remained at a low level throughout the night. So I think it's concerning to some extent and we'll see you know, what his status is uh, on the injury report rather shortly uh, for Sixers Bulls on Wednesday. But definitely strange if Rivers was aware that he was hurting to continue riding him, to let him go for 46 minutes. And I think you saw the Sixers had other guards who were doing well. You know, D'Anthony Melton had a fantastic game. Uh, Shake Milton had a nice little stint early in the fourth quarter. So wouldn't have been too tricky to uh, reduce Harden's minutes if, Rivers was aware that uh, he wasn't at his best physically, and he even had a, a comparable situation, I think, with Jalen McDaniels, with uh, Rivers noting that, yeah, he wasn't moving great out there, and that's why I didn't play him in the fourth quarter in the overtimes. Uh, McDaniels came back from this right hip injury, but appears uh, he has some lingering issues with that. So not a great night for the Sixers uh, in terms of the offensive output frustrating that they went you know 58 minutes and didn't get a victory and the health uh, picture has taken a negative turn as well but I think uh, regardless yeah with 11 games to go uh, we're still looking at an excellent basketball team that uh, has done very very well in the month of March and we wait and see um, you know whether there's any reason to you know, have sustained worry with uh, James Harden. Obviously, he's necessary if this team wants to to make a deep run. I know oh, they've been oh, he's necessary. That's yeah, for sure. I know they've been great this year at the next man up mentality, mm -hmm. and you've seen a bunch of games where Milton and Melton and House and Yang and various role players have shined and enabled the Sixers to win when shorthanded. 
But for the postseason, uh, the Sixers' odds would certainly decrease if they do not have the uh, James Harden, who's been, you know, arguably an All NBA caliber player uh, for the vast majority of the season. Hey, you talk about the odds. The NBA power rankings before uh, yesterday's game had the Sixers at numero uno. Yes, they had the eight game win streak. Yes, that was the longest streak in the league. And Joel has taken over the MVP race odds in a lot of instances and places where you can get those odds. So it, it's uh, logical to to see how the Sixers have r- risen to the top. They have this tough loss last night in the game. They should have won. You know what? how that affects the standings and the power rankings, what they mean really don't mean a whole lot. But at the same time, it is recognition for what the Sixers have accomplished. And on top of that, you mentioned, you know, James Harden and his situation. And we have talked ad nauseum about the fact that health is going to be the primary factor of what happens to the Sixers team. But it was the health of Joel B that we were most focused on. But when you factor in, you know, James Harden and his contribution and, and what he brings to the squad, um, and we had talked about those minutes, too, and, and just how m- many minutes he had been playing coming right back f- off of the injury. There really was no, like, ramp up for him. It just kind of, like, all happened at once. So it's definitely something worth monitoring. Um, it was maybe a little bit of a throwaway comment from Doc Rivers when he mentioned the Harden's injury, but the follow-up question by the reporter really uh, emphasized that that wasn't slipping through the cracks for, by the media. So... I'm I'm curious to see how it plays out. And I mean, Harden going 0 for 3, 0 for 6 from three point land and 2 of 14 from the floor tells you that it, it's not just something to balk at. Um, wh- how would you play this? What, what would you do? Uh, it, let's just say it's a nagging injury. Maybe it's a flare up. It's not anything significant. Are, are you kind of really playing this really cautiously here with 11 games to go, some tough games coming up. Seeding is important. How do, how do you play this with your Doc Rivers and company? Well, yeah, I, I don't think Doc Rivers should be the one with uh, the most authority in the situation. I think you want to lean on the medical staff. Yeah. The head athletic trainer, Kevin Johnson and um, you know, folks above him. And obviously James Harden should have some level of input. If there's a pain, soreness, variable here but you don't want to put too much on the player's plate because we know James Harden has a long history of always pushing to be available uh, and had a reputation of being an Ironman sort of star in his Rockets days so I think there's there's still a lot to learn and yeah we don't want to overstate uh, the level to which you know Sixers fans should be panicking or anything like that it's quite possible we're talking in a few days and Harden plays Wednesday and looks totally fine. But uh, yeah, if there's any reason to think that playing him Wednesday is not beneficial to his health, then totally makes sense to sit him. And uh, I think the number two versus number three seed uh, discussion, sure, two is absolutely preferable. You'd love to have more games at home in the postseason, but it's not worth uh, the risk of, you know, jeopardizing a, a star player's health. But and luckily they've built up enough uh, leeway between them and the Cavaliers mm-hmm. so that yeah. they have a little cushion there as the season comes to a close. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think regardless, uh, this always needs to be the the utmost priority, the, the health of the star players. But I think a lot of this is uh, TPD. We'll, we'll learn more shortly and um, – Hopefully this for the Sixers, it's it's not a worst case scenario sort of outcome. Um, but James Harden, absolutely a cornerstone of this team. And I think it's hard to overemphasize how large a role he's played in them uh, exceeding expectations after after starting 12 and 12 and just being a fantastic conductor of this offense, leading the league in assists per game. So if it's uh, not a great outcome, that's a bummer. But uh, we, we shall see what happens here. Hey, a couple of more baskets from that guy, James Harden. And we could be talking about uh, a nine game winning streak for the 76ers. While that is snapped, some streaks do continue as Joel Embiid goes for 37, albeit on a night he fouls out in double OT. Um, he goes for 37. This 10 straight games with 30 or more points. He is the Eastern Conference Player of the Week. Odds on favorite for Eastern Conference Player of the Month. Um 
it, it's just astounding to continue to watch the production that he gives this team, uh, how he continue, continues to rise to the occasion, how unstoppable he continues to be. Um, here is the heaping of praise part of the podcast for Joel Embiid, where even though the Sixers lost, he continues to shine in an immaculate way. And it's interesting just, uh, you know, continuing to watch him score on all three levels, man. It's just uh, the mid-range game is so great, even when there's a player his size and Vucevic there, who I found out uh, from listening to the game on the radio from Tom McGinnis that he's an Eagles fan. So do with that what you want. But uh, but even where's a guy his size, a, a guy that's not his size, a guy who uh, is a double team, triple team, he's evolved and continued to grow in a way that uh, I, I, many fans should should marvel at. And we'll get to George Carl's comments because it's interesting to hear what some of these old heads have to say sometimes. But um, just a great time to be Joel Embiid and to be a fan of Joel Embiid because he continues to produce and give you something to root for. Right. I mean, he's extending his own franchise record at this point uh, for the 30 plus and the efficiency, you know, continues to be marvelous. Also, I think notable that he's got uh, mul multiple blocks in seven consecutive games. And uh, I think even that doesn't fully capture that a uh, defensive impact, obviously a tricky situation once he picked up the fifth foul where he knows he needs to stay in the game because he's so valuable to his that team. Was, and, and and I am, uh, you know, Joel is Joel, and he gets a, the benefit of the doubt on some calls. And, you know, we had that instance the other night where it looked like he had committed an offensive foul for his final foul, but ends up getting a reprieve. But that was a ticky-tack six foul, man. I don't even think he even fouled uh, Zach Levine, you know, going to the basket. Just more of an embellishment, but – it was it was a tough foul to go out on after he had survived that long with five fouls through the, in the fourth quarter and to, to two overtime. So it was it was a tough way to go out in my my eyes. Yeah, and it was I think a bummer for the Sixers too because even after that they went up by four points right on the Tobias Harris jumper. I thought mm -hmm. that was it. Yeah, <laughs> and you know they almost put James Harden for a couple possessions in the Joel Embiid role at the nail and. Uh, back to back buckets. Yeah, one by Maxi, one by Harris, but just unable to stop DeMar DeRozan, who was, you know, clutch when the Bulls needed him to. And any loss uh, hurts, but I think, you know, having the extra 10 minutes on the legs makes it sting a little extra. But yeah, for, for Embiid, uh, the two way impact is just immense. It's, it's historic. And uh, we got a little historical context on that yesterday, too, because. The Sixers celebrated the 82-83 champs, the 40th anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, those guys, you know, it's it's always bittersweet, I think, when there's a reunion because um, the late Moses Malone, you know, was, you know, the star of that team along with Dr. J and the other Hall of Famers. But, um, you know, the heart of that team in many ways. And uh, we heard from Bobby Jones that that Joel Embiid does remind him. Facility. right? Yeah. yeah, in the morning, you know, um, Bobby Bobby Jones said that, it's really similar where if you dump the ball into Embiid, like it shouldn't come back out because he is, he is that dominant that if there's two guys on him. If there are three guys on him, like you trust that he is going to find a way to score. Um, so this, this is a historically great center, you know, in NBA history and Sixers history. Um, and I think, you know, for me, that was reinforced a little yesterday, just hearing that perspective. I think, you know, Moses Malone is, understandably revered you know as a three-time mvp and uh the guy who you know difference maker yeah last last led the sixers to a title and um was just such a such a force and i think Embiid is similar where there is really an all-consuming dominance to his game uh where it, if he is on the floor you just feel really damn good about your team's chances of winning the game uh so that was cool yesterday and yeah, we heard Dr. J uh, issued a challenge at halftime. He said it's been way too long since the Sixers have won a title for years. And, uh, you know, he wants to see this year's team do it. And obviously, if they do, uh, Embiid is going to be the number one reason why. Mo Cheeks, uh, an assistant on that Bulls squad. So he was all in the excitement and the 40 an 40th anniversary celebration. Um, I was going to save this for later. 
But this is one of my late night thoughts last night. And I, I wanted to bring it up now since you brought up the 82 83 championship team uh, anniversary. So they were at the practice facility and at the arena. Uh, Doc Rivers addresses the crowd at halftime. He's all sharp with the hat and the broadcast team with Ala and Kate interview him. And it just made me think what does Dr. J call Doc Rivers? Does he call him Doc? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, I think. Doc Does he go Glenn? Does he? No, I think Doc. I think. Um, hey, Doc, like you're actually named after me, but I'm going to call you Doc mm -hmm. still. No, he, Doc Rivers has told a story a couple of times of just he had a lot of nerves going into his first NBA matchup with with Dr. J, Julius Irving. And, oh, I think I've heard this. Yeah, Irving yeah. was just very welcoming to him. And it's yeah. like, you know, it's, it's fine that you're also called Doc. And um, I just want to hear him say it out of his mouth, I think, is the thing. Like, oh, hey, Doc. Mm -hmm. like, like, you know, Dr. J calling Rivers. That, 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 I think that would be the ultimate christening, I think. But Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of mutual respect there. Yeah. And Doc Rivers was um, a junior at Marquette when that, uh, team one in 82, 83, about to, you know, embark on a long NBA career and has a ton of admiration for those guys and, you know, did his best to uh, pass down some of the knowledge about the members of that team. But um, it was funny just hearing various Sixers, you know, answer the question of how familiar they were with the 82, 83 squad. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Didn't they do an in, in arena what did Moses Malone fo 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 mean? Yeah, I believe uh, <laughs> the the fan who was chosen for that, uh, you know, was not the most knowledgeable. But <laughs> so yeah, the Sixers at least at least uh, know that they all knew who Julius Serving was, Moses right. Malone. I think beyond that, um, there was some education happening where you know <laughs> there were uh, they were putting names to faces and you know learning about Bobby Jones's history, the first ever Six Man of the Year winner in eighty two, right. eighty three, and uh, Jones, you know, told all of them about the importance of of role players on a, a championship squad and also had a message to not worry about the officiating, which I think is much easier said than done. But uh, they tried to pass along wisdom, the 82, 83 guys. And I think even if the Sixers did not have a deep familiarity, they, you know, appreciated and respected uh, those folks coming back. And it was strong attendance uh, with, you know, the very notable exception of Andrew Tony was was not there, um, and and Doc Rivers even said pregame like we got to get him back here. Uh, you know, such a great player. And... Well, you bring that up. It, it, is there some offense that needs to be mended between him and the organization? What what's what's the hang up there? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, just the the latest I've read on it. Um, there's a piece by Gordy Jones in the Athletic in 2019. You know, there's not any you know lingering animosity necessarily with him and Harold Katz. They you know, correspond, you know, via email and stuff like that. And you Julie serving reclusive, more reclusive. Or? Yeah. Julie serving has said, you know, they hang out um, a good amount. Uh, they're both in the Atlanta area and he even named him um, as, as the guy he, you know, sees the most um, throughout the year. So it's, it's hard to say. I, I don't want to, you know, yeah. speak for Andrew Tony right. other than, other than to note there is indeed, you know, animosity in that past. And, Seems like a lot of that is faded, but perhaps these sort of events um, are still not Andrew Tony's mm -hmm. cup of tea. Um, but I think everyone would love to see him there. And, you know, everyone who's associated with the Sixers hopes the next time there's something similar that uh, he is on hand. I wish someone had asked about the curse of Moses Malone. I wish... curse, uh, it's not his curse, is it? Uh, it's not, I mean, it's the fact that they traded Moses sure. and they haven't won a championship since. And they haven't had well, Joel and B kind of breaks the curse of not having a quality big man ever since then as well. But I, I want to know what they think about that. Did they buy into that? Have they heard it? Do they consider it a viable thing? You know, just stuff that I grew up with with my dad and him keeping that on me. But uh, we're going to talk a little more and get back to Joel and B after we pay some bills here. Of course, we are brought to you here on the Sixers Talk podcast by Wilmington University. Wilm U works. Wilmington University and students are in the game, upskill in fields like cybersecurity, fintech, healthcare, and education in person or online. Get in the game at Wilmington University. Find us at wilmu.edu. Injured? 
For over 70 years, Lundy Law has been the number one personal injury law firm in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Their services are exemplary. Their results are exceptional. Call 1-800-LUNDY-LAW to get the money you deserve. Of course, we're here at Rivers Casino right here on Delaware Avenue. It's time to rush to new rewards at Rivers Casino. Now there's a whole new way for you to earn, redeem, and level up your rewards. Get your new Rush Rewards card and get more out of your game at Rivers Casino Philadelphia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Well, here we are in the thick of the uh, MVP race uh, that, depending on who you ask, is very undecided. Um of course, we're here in Philadelphia. There's a lot of slant towards Joel Embiid. It's very interesting to see uh, and hear from people outside of the area, although George Carl, who we have alluded to, has a specific slant as a member of the Denver Nuggets, uh, coached the team and played for them, as, if my memory is correct. Um, and he was being interviewed, I believe it was on Sirius XM. And before, if you haven't heard his comments, before I get into it, it is a hotly contested race. So picking Nikola Jokic or Joel Embiid doesn't make you wrong. I mean, each of these guys is very deserving of being in consideration. Um, people picking Giannis as the MVP, I think, would be more outside of the norm than picking. It, it's it's a toss up. I mean, both of these guys are really good. Both of them are deserving of the race. I give Joel the edge because of his prowess on both ends of the floor. Um, but whether or not you pick Nikola Jokic or Joel Embiid, I think the Achilles heel of what George Carl had to say is that he said of the games that he's seen Joel Embiid. So he doesn't see Joel Embiid that much. He's seen him, uh, I would assume, a handful of times. He said that he feels like he takes plays off. Maybe in the games that he saw, Joel takes plays off. And that has been a viable uh, critique of Joel in the past. I don't think that's true this year. I think he's in the best shape he's ever been in. And I think that um, he has shown incredible versatility and endurance and doesn't take plays off like Joel, like uh, George Carl alluded to. Or what about the plays Nikola Jokic takes off on the defensive end? Are we going to mention those? Or is that going to be uh, a detriment to his consideration for MVP? But I think George Carl's not wrong picking Nicola over Joel because I think it's a toss up. I think he had, that hasn't watched Joel enough to be able to give a viable opinion. I think that older guys, uh, you know, tend to be set in their ways more. I won't hold that against George Carl, but I think he had more of a Homer slant with picking Nicola Jokic, but you heard George's comments, Noah, what did you think? And what, what did you buy uh, out of what he said? Just the the background here is is honestly a bit strange. I mean, you have Kobe Carl is the head coach of the Dar Delaware Blue Coats, Georgia's son. Uh, so I think he is quite familiar with the Sixers organization. And I wouldn't be shocked if he is tuning into a good number of Sixers games and, and very interested in the team. And then just his relationship with Doc Rivers over the years, uh, there's been a lot of messiness there. And I think it would be fair to call it, you know, a mix. You think all of he's holding that against Joel, though? Because of the relationship with him and Doc, or are you just saying I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to you know analyze the motivation behind it, his opinions other than to just say that background is is fascinating to me and mm -hmm. I think it's unique and regardless like yeah it is a fact that you know he, he coached the Nuggets he loves the Nuggets and a Nuggets star being a all world player is something that George Carl enjoys very much I think he's open about that. But yeah, man, just going back through the history of the relationship with Rivers, some of that uh, was really ugly and, mm -hmm. um, you know, not some some kind of inexcusable comments by George Carl there when uh, Doc Rivers, you know, was a young head coach about him not being worthy of the job. So, uh, yeah, regardless, like the substance of the comments, you know, I guess everyone can have their own opinion about what is good or bad body language, but if you're making arguments that include, you know, body language critiques, um, they're easy to pick apart right. because it's super subjective. Uh, and clearly that leaves you much more open to, you know, valid allegations of being biased. If you're coming up with these intangible reasons why a guy's style of play, you know, isn't to your liking or something along those lines. But look, Rivers said, said pregame, and I guess, you know, a subtweety kind of comment, just we don't need to tear guys down. Like, 
there are so many great players in this league, so many players, uh, to your point, you know, in that MVP mix, you know, legitimately, and he, he doesn't want the race or the discussion to be dominated by why X or Y player is undeserving or why that player's style, you know, isn't someone's cup of tea. Um, I think that's a great point to make, but I also think it's unrealistic. I think right. we're uh, pretty far down the track of a lot of these debates uh, sort of Propping coming. up some things and tearing down others. Yeah, and, yeah, it just comes from the framework of it's insufficient to show that your guy or the player you think is the best is fantastic. Uh, there's a burden on you to... Uh, note why that player is superior and that inevitably seems to devolve into the guy that you know they are better than is you know fundamentally flawed or you know a bad you know star or what have you so uh yeah i think we're all for we're all for positivity we're all for highlighting the players and the skills that make the modern nba game so great and We'd love to see more of that, but um, there's there's just the current path we're on is is not one that I think is uh, trending in that direction. And yeah, George Carl's comments probably didn't help that. And I think, okay, you know, to decide on the MVP, you can't just make the personal judgment of, I think this player is great, therefore he's MVP. You do have to do some comparison, right? But I don't think body language or laziness or uh, those kind of personal, you know, judgment should really be central to an argument. Um, and I think when someone does include them in their argument, uh, they certainly leave themselves open to a heck of a lot of criticism. And uh, that is that is the case with uh, what George Carl had to say. Well, we will see Joel Embiid and he will have some good challenges coming up here after the Bulls game on Wednesday, the Warriors on Friday, the Suns on Saturday in a back to back. Wow. Uh, and then three games in four days with Denver on Monday, uh, the Mavericks, Raptors, Bucks, Celtics, Heat, Hawks, Nets finish out the schedule. So some tough matchups in there for the Sixers. Um, and they are in the midst of this uh, seven of eight on the road the one lone home game in there we saw last night. So we were not going to see them at the Wells Fargo center for a little bit. Um, are you, how much are you looking forward to these West coast matchups, uh, particularly the three with Denver Phoenix and the warriors? That'll be fun. I, I think in part because up until last night, the Sixers offense this year has been the best we've seen in a very long time. I mean, that's been the strength of their team. And I think more of the questions have been defensive. So uh, if the Sixers team that we've seen most of the season shows up, you know, I could see that Warriors being game being a fun shootout, you know, a 130, 127 kind of Ooh. game, or uh, obviously the, the Phoenix game. Uh, there's also plenty of offensive firepower on both sides. Uh, so, yeah, I think, these tests are, are ones that the Sixers tend to embrace, and uh, they've been excellent on the road this year at consistently bringing strong effort and uh, showing up for, for difficult games and, and winning quite a few of them. But obviously the Harden health uh, situation hangs over everything right now, and uh, hopefully we'll get clarity on that, and the Sixers hope that it's uh, decent news. So if he's available, then... I think they'll believe in themselves to win most of the final 11. If he's not, um, I don't think the level of self-belief drops off drastically, but right. I think uh, the expectations of what they're actually capable of, yeah, it's fair enough. If uh, you don't think the Sixers are, are going to run the table here, you know, if James Harden's uh, not doing so well health-wise. Three weeks of regular season basketball left. It has been a battle of attrition with the ups and downs and ends and outs of this year, as it often is, because 82 games is a lot. But um, exciting to see how this thing's come, thing comes to a close. Uh, before we close out, I want to say rest in peace to Willis Reed, who passed away at NBA legend, uh, New York Knicks great. Um, 
we all have seen him come out of that tunnel uh, one time or another during our NBA upbringing here. And uh, he passed away today at the age of 80. So I want to say RIP to him. Um, much love to everyone out there. We appreciate you tuning in. Be sure to check us out on all of your social media platforms and wherever you get your podcasts. Come on out to Rivers Casino and check us out. We'd love to see you. For Noah Levick and Ben Barry, I'm Danny Pomels. This has been the Sixers Talk Podcast brought to you by Wilmington University, Wilmy Works. Yeah. <laughs>